At the beginning of the 19th century, Lavere was plagued by great poverty, not only material, but also of a moral and spiritual nature. The French wars, drought and famine impoverished a population already living in misery. As was the case throughout the majority of Italy, the arrival of invasive epidemics caused a depopulation of Lovere. In addition to this phenomenon was the influence of anti-religious sentiments that threatened the Christian ideals and way of life. In this harsh landscape, humanitarian emergencies awaited a concrete intervention of evangelical charity. And it wasn't long in coming. Many people with good souls responded to these needs and did great deeds. Among them, Bartolomeo Capitanio and Vincenzo Girosa, our saints. We usually think of Vincenzo Girosa as having both an austere yet gentle face, framed by a black pleated cap and a religious habit that identified her as a nun of charity. The same ensemble that she wore on November the 21st in 1835 in Lovere. Christened as Caterina, she only received the name of Sister Vincenza at the time that she entered into the religious profession, as if to signify that through her, there would be the continuation of that wonderful synthesis between the love of God and the love of thy neighbour that St. Vincent de Paul had proposed to the Daughters of Charity. Caterina Girosa, later Vincenza, was born in Lovere on the 29th of October 1784 to Gian Antonio and Giacomina Macario. After her, three younger sisters were born. One entered heaven at the mere age of two. Francesca died at 17 and Rosa was with Caterina until November 1829, when she too left this earth. At that time in Lavere, the Girosa family ranked amongst the most well-off in terms of both possessions and the profitable business that they were involved in, that of the tanning and leather trade. Despite having this good economic position, Caterina's family maintained a modest standard of living. Her mother was committed to raising her daughters and grandchildren in the fear of God, and they also partook in charity work. Caterina grew up in this family, cultivating piety and faith, and in love for God and neighbour. She learned to read and write from her uncles, who soon introduced her to their company's work a family business which did not present economic problems, but where suffering was not lacking. There was discord between the brothers. Caterina's father was kept aloof from business, probably because he was not particularly skilled. This caused great displeasure in both Caterina and her mother, Giacomina. And it was precisely the relationship between Caterina and her mother which was to be the first great sacrifice to which the future saint was subjected. Her relatives did not hold particular esteem for her mother, Giacomina, and on the death of her father, Gian Antonio, Caterina was asked not to see her mother again, who was sent away. At first reaction, one would reasonably think that the young Caterina should have left her aunts and uncles and followed her mother, 
but the parish priest himself advised her to stay with the family. Only in this way would she have the means to support her mother. Katerina, deep with sorrow, stayed with her father's family. She accepted this sacrifice deep down in her heart, to suffer and keep silent, content to go with her mother in heart, since she was not allowed to go in person. Her mother died on February the 8th, 1814, when Katerina was 30 years old. Katerina learned to share her suffering with Jesus crucified. From him, she drew the strength to carry her cross and gradually enter the core of Christian mystery, which is the mystery of death and life, death and resurrection. She didn't complain to anyone or about anyone. She understood that faced with her family situation, all that remained was for her to see, hear, suffer, keep silent sure in her conviction that our frailties and miseries do not prevent God from loving us, and that through the cross of Christ, we can find meaning even in things that do not immediately make sense, like suffering, personal limits, and death. Katerina opened up to the poor and the needy in both body and spirit. She felt compelled to spread God's charity between those who were hungry, thirsty, naked or sick. Katerina was close to the poor and to the crucifix. In fact, she was known to say, who knows the crucifix knows everything. Who were the poor in Jerosa's time? The historical period leads us to think of the Lombard population, afflicted and impoverished by the Napoleonic Wars, by famines, by pestilence, People who lacked what was necessary to live, wheat, bread or flour for polenta. Katerina gave charity, but with criteria. She gave to those in need. She did not, as she said herself, give water to the sea, but rather to those who were thirsty, bread to those who were hungry. She gave warmly and in the moment of need. Katerina's life was interwoven with this petty charity that she supplied day after day in line with the needs of her brothers and sisters, with many faces and many names, in which within all she saw the face that has the traits of all, the face of Christ. Chirosa's poor were also the sick, without assistance, left to themselves. She went to treat them and to visit their families and did not rest until she built a home for them a gift from her family, a public hospital. A hospital where she herself, with another young woman, Bartolomea Capitanio, tended to them. Sister Vincenza died at the age of 63 after the birth and spread of the Institute of the Sisters of Charity. She died after a few weeks of illness on June 29, 1847. On her deathbed, she pronounced the words of Jesus, 
love one another and you will have God's blessing. Bartolomea Capitano was born in Lovere to Modesto and Caterina Canossi on the 13th of January 1807. She had two brothers and four sisters, who all, except one, died in childhood, leaving a profound pain, especially for her mother. Bartolomea's family was of modest means. Her father's shop, which traded in grain, provided the means for subsistence, yet also spared for charity. Her mother educated her and her surviving sister with a profound Christian sense and Bartolomea grew up a lively and good-natured girl. Unfortunately, Bartolomea's father abused the use of wine and became aggressive both at home and in public, so much so that in the village he was called Modestino the Madman. The trials of this situation penetrated Bartolomea's heart and predisposed her from childhood to unite her own sufferings with those of Jesus and to open herself with compassion for the frailties and miseries of others. Her mother, both to protect her daughter from painful family situations and because Bartolomea appeared intelligent and eager to learn, did everything to entrust her to the education of the poor Clares. Bartolomea entered the boarding school at the age of 11 and a half and dedicated herself to learning the practice of virtue. She forged strong friendships with her companions and her teacher, and she opened up to the charm of holiness thanks to the example of the sisters of the poor Clares. Bartolomea was 12 years old when Sister Francesca initiated a game of lots where she and her companions must draw from a pack of straws. She drew the longest one, a sign that of all of them, she would be the first to become a saint. From that moment on, Bartolomea made the resolution that she would never give up. I want to become a saint soon and a great saint. A sincere expression, but one still marked by the naivety of adolescence. Yet, Bartolomea had to humbly follow the path to holiness, in reverence of the Holy Spirit, who would guide her throughout a progressive liberation from herself, ultimately leading her to understand that I want was not her initiative, but God's. Bartolomea left the poor Claire's boarding school at the age of 17. Alongside those sisters, consecrated to God in prayer, she had a profound experience of the Lord and gave herself to him by taking the vow of chastity. She was grateful because Jesus, King of heaven and earth, deigned to choose her as his bride. This was not a presumption, moreover a trust in a God who loved her to the point of giving his blood on the cross. She exclaimed, I fear nothing because I am in the hands of a God who loves me as a father. She recounted that a great light had been lit in her heart. Jesus loved her and chose her so that she could be all of her. This certainty of hers provoked her to reciprocate the embrace of his love in her day-to-day -day life. Not without difficulty, 
she overcame the attraction of the cloister that had surfaced in her heart during the years of her education at the Poor Clares. She felt ever more within her the call to industrious charity for the good of others. Girls without families, those without education, disoriented young people, the sick without assistance, and the poor of the districts of Lovere awaited her. From a letter to her friend Mariana Vertova, we read, That blessed charity towards thy neighbour that Jesus Christ practised so much throughout his life appeals to me exceedingly, and the practice of it is a delight that I don't think any cloistered religious can ever experience. Bartolomea soon committed herself to the good work she could do. She educated the girls in the school she opened in her house taught them about the catechism. She animated the oratory and took care of the young girls. She wove friendships and assisted the sick in their homes and in hospitals, always with the ultimate intention of helping everyone to find Christ. Bartolomea felt she was not doing enough to fulfill all of the needs of those around her. It was necessary to find a sustainable way to be able to cater these demands. But Olamea prayed, questioned herself, confronted herself, and thanks to these efforts, the project of an institute wholly based on charity gradually came to life. From Bartolomea's notes we read, after a good hour in which I anxiously considered the various types of religious institutes, I sincerely declare before God, the Lord is calling me to an institute, the purpose of which is the works of mercy, and that this is what at the point of death I would be happy to have embraced. Her wish was for the institute to be instated in Lovery as soon as possible. She wished to touch those walls which would be the house of the Lord. At the same time, she was willing to even wait a hundred years, or even to not witness its birth, if that were God's will. When Bartolomea received the bishop's approval, she wept with joy, and in that consent she interpreted the seal of God's will. To carry out the project, she needed a partner and a house. Don Angelo Bozio and the parish priest collaborated for the purchase of the house and in the meantime Caterina Gerosa, who shared Bartolomeo's ideals, offers in pure faith to join her in order. On the night of the 21st of November 1832, Bartolomeo kept vigil in her room waiting for dawn to go to the parish church of San Giorgio and then to Casagaya to consecrate herself entirely to God for the good of others. She wrote The Humble Offering, where she hands herself over to the Lord in poverty, acknowledging the initiative of her work. Here I am, Jesus most beloved. I have reached at last the longed for moment of my sacrifice. Today, through the hands of Mary, I have the blessedness of consecrating myself wholly and irrevocably to your glory and to the service of my neighbor. In Bartolomea too, that change takes place which, in the amazement of God's revelation, makes St. Paul say, By the grace of God, I am what I am. Thus, on the 21st of November 1832, the Institute of the Sisters of Charity was born in Lovere. Bartolomea and Caterina gathered the schoolgirls and orphans in Gaia House. In the hospital they assisted the sick, in the oratory, they animated the young girl's Christian spirits. To all the needy, they said, now we are all yours, because they understood that belonging to Jesus in an authentic way also meant belonging to one's brothers and sisters. The Institute now underway, one would hope that the path begun would continue in the best possible way, but God's plan soon manifested itself in a different way. On the morning of the 1st of April, 1833, Bartolomeo returned home from the parish church with a fever, went to bed and showed no signs of recovery. Gerosa, seeing Bartolomeo get worse, 
felt increasingly less able to carry on the running of the Institute. On July 26th, 1833, eight months after its foundation, and at only 26 years of life, Bartolomeo, pronouncing the sweet names of Jesus and Mary, went with the Lord. Before dying, she tried to soothe the tears of those around her by saying, when I'm in heaven, I'll be able to do much more than if I stayed here. In the aftermath of Bartolomea's death, the people dejected by her loss considered saying their goodbyes to the Institute. But what is born from the message of God does not die. Jerosa, regaining her strength, trusted in God and remained to continue the Bartolomea's ideals that she proposed yet lived for a very short time. In her turn, she handed it over to the daughters of the Institute, the Sisters of Charity. Bartolomea paved the way and then, like the grain of wheat, went under the ground, so that from her death the year could be born and the adventure of God, who takes care of man through man, could continue. The institute, which was born from the intuition of the young Bartolomea, the teacher of Lovre, expands beyond the boundaries of the village thanks to Caterina Gerosa, later sister Vincenza, who was older than Bartolomea and already expert in charity. A few decades later, the people of Milan named the Capitanio sisters as the Sisters of Child Mary, following the gift of a miraculous simulacrum through which devotion to the birth of Mary spread. Founded in response to the needs of a historical moment that heralded profound social, economic and cultural changes, the Institute's mission is to participate in the merciful charity of Jesus the Redeemer, opening oneself to compassion for every human sufferance and to serve their brothers and sisters in their need. It addresses the poorest, the abandoned, the disoriented, to the sick, the elderly, the marginalised and to those who do not yet know the Gospel. The Institute has now become international. It currently operates in Europe, in Italy, Spain and Romania, in Asia, in India since 1860, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, Japan, Israel, Palestine and Nepal, in America, in Argentina, Brazil, Peru, Uruguay, California, and in Africa, in Egypt, Ethiopia, Zambia and Zimbabwe. Let us heed the words of the Bishop of Brescia, Pier Antonio Tremolada, for a final compendium on the teachings of the saints Bartolomea and Vincenza. We often have the impression that we can't find the right words to express and communicate, to make people understand what these women meant. Beyond what can be told of their lives, there is something we've never been able to translate, something that refers to the secret of their hearts and to how they came to be holy. We see holiness in their deeds, but the acts are the representation of what we all have inside. Some new stories lead us to think, how did that person arrive at this point? We can ask ourselves the same of those whose deeds have rendered them great. Let us look at the secret. Let us concentrate on the fruitfulness of their charism. We can observe their acts of charity, but we can only intuit what they conceal. We are confronted with feelings such as mercy, goodness, humility, meekness and patience. And above all these sentiments, charity reigns. And this is the word that more than any other is able to unify the lives of Bartolomea and Vincenza. The word charity. Bartolomea Capitanio and Vincenza Gerosa, faced with the realities of their time, felt the irresistible call of blessed charity. They saw Christ in the poor and evidenced him as the answer to their deepest needs. The church posthumously proclaimed them saints in 1950.